DNA in the Book of Mormon can be a very controversial topic. Last year we talked with Dr. Ugo Perego of Italy and talked with him about the Book of Mormon and DNA. This year we'll get a contrasting point of view from Australian researcher Dr. Simon Southerton. I'll have him introduce himself in just a moment, but just briefly he served as an LDS bishop in Australia until he could no longer reconcile the science. Check out our conversation. I also want to remind you to please give us a review on iTunes and also please subscribe on YouTube on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash gospel tangents. We appreciate your support. Now back to our conversation. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited all the way from Australia. We've had a guy from Italy and now Australia. We're, we're, we're going worldwide now. Um, so could you introduce yourself and, and tell us who you are? My name is Simon Sullivan. I'm from Canberra, Australia. Uh, I retired now from science, really. I was a uh, molecular geneticist working with CSIRO um, for almost 20 years. Um, I'm married to Jane and we have five children and I like mountain biking and some road cycling and well, great. that sort of stuff. Well, great. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. realize you were retired now. You're too yeah, young for I'm that, aren't you? I'm fairly young. I might, be, I might go and create some mischief somewhere else. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, CSIRO is tri and as, a, as an organization is Trimback and so the forestry research um, group was disbanded about two or three years ago. Oh wow. Yeah, and and so I've gradually moved out of out of uh, science. Still interested in science but um, not working. Okay. Well great. Could you give us a little idea on your educational background? Um, how you how you learned all about genetics and DNA and stuff? Yeah, uh, well I was always interested in agriculture, like, you know, growing plants, more interested in plants than animals, but um, so I went to the University of Sydney where I studied agriculture, got an agricultural science degree and then towards the end of that I specialised in uh, plant disease, so I worked on diseases that infect wheat, which is Australia's major export crop. And it was during that uh, research uh, in my PhD that I, um, DNA technology was just emerging and I could see the power of DNA technology. And and so I took up a postdoc after uh, s my PhD at CS uh, sorry at um, the University of Sydney, and went to the United Kingdom and worked in uh, a plant science institute uh, near Norwich in the UK for a couple of years. Then I returned to Australia and um, essentially joined CSIRO a few years later, where I worked in forestry genetics and forestry molecular genetics. And I was there for almost 20 years, and eventually I led the, the forestry genetics group for for about seven or eight years. Oh wow! Mm. Well, very interesting. So, and sadly, it's um, been closed down. Forestry is not a major industry in Australia, and we've always struggled for funding. And that's just the way of the world. Things, some areas of research boom, and some bust. Mm -hmm. So it uh, eventually it wound up in 2014. So. And so you're, you're retired already, that just doesn't sound Well, I'm 57, it is too young, so uh, almost 58, but I, yeah, I'll, I'll probably get involved in something else, I'm not sure at this stage. But okay. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you here at Gospel Tangents, I like to get a lot of, of different opinions, and I, I uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Ugo Perego mm -hmm. uh, a, a little a few months ago. Um, and uh, you have a little different perspective uh, on DNA and the Book of Mormon. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. I know you've written a book. Can you, can you tell mm -hmm. us about the book? Uh. Yeah, well, the book is called Losing a Lost Tribe. And I wrote that in, published that in 2005, I think. Um, the impetus to write the book was I was not happy with the way I was, um, the DNA science was being interpreted by church apologists um, and I felt that was a way of putting them right and correcting them. I don't know how many apologists have even bothered to read my book. There, there was a review written of my book by Ryan Parr and I am absolutely certain he hasn't read my book. <laughs> um, but that's the nature of uh, the apologetic beast, their conclusions are already fixed. 
Um, they're not interested in weighing up both sides of the argument. They're only interested in in the the, the facts that fit with their viewpoint. So, um, but yeah, no, I published the book in two thousand and five. Um, and yeah, since then I think I've maintained a reasonable interest, fairly close interest in the in the science. I don't think it's correct to say that my interpretation of the science is much different to Hugo. Oh, and really? Hugo uh, and I agree on the fact that they haven't found Lehigh DNA, and that's certainly correct. Um, no. As far as I'm aware, in the literature, and I've searched the literature fairly extensively, and they haven't identified any Middle Eastern DNA, uh, certainly that arrived prior to Columbus, in Native Americans. So on that point, we largely agree. Okay. <coughs> so yeah, there, it sounds like there's still some, some different interpretations going on, and I, and I really want to get into that in just a second. So um, could you tell us a little bit about your LDS background? I think you were serving, you served as a bishop one yeah, time. yeah. I've um, up until I encountered the DNA, I was a very, uh, pretty much committed member. I mean, I, everyone has little things that bug them at church, but um, I didn't have any reason to be uh, concerned about anything. Um, I first became troubled when I read an article in the Ensign by uh, Donald Parry, who's a, a, a biblical scholar f at BYU, and it was on the flood and. Uh, the Tower of Babel and it categorized people into either those who completely denied the global flood, those that interpreted the evidence of science to and concluded it was a local event, which, which I did, and there were those who accepted it completely, that there was a, a global catastrophe, catastrophe four and a half thousand years ago. And that's simply not the case. There has not been a global flood because the, the evidence for that event, it would have been so catastrophic in the genetics, in the geology, so many branches of science would have found evidence for that. And so I felt this article made me, lumped me in with the, the sorry, the flood deniers and, and I felt very uncomfortable about that. I was serving as a bishop, working hard for the church, I was devout. and. That led me eventually to search online for um, writings from other Mormon scholars about the flood, and there was nothing I could find. Um, but I did encounter the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian Institute has written a, um, at the time, a letter, a form letter. They get so many inquiries from Mormons about how the Book of Mormon is helping them with their research into Native Americans, that they wrote this form letter distancing themselves from anything to do with the Book of Mormon and it completely um, dismissed the Book of Mormon and gave a whole list of evidence. The state, the, all the evidence didn't have as much impact on me as the way that was written. It just left me with this conclusion that these scientists were completely and utterly convinced that Native Americans had nothing to do with the Middle East. Now, I, I haven't done a lot of research into the Native American archaeology or the anthropology or their linguistics or anything. Probably because I'm in Australia and it's not a major interest for us, not a hobby down down there. And so but it 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 troubled me. It's they were so certain and so I went on the internet was just emerging and I had access to search engines and I searched online for work research about Native Americans. And because I work with DNA, it wasn't long before I typed in Native American DNA, and that's when I encountered the research. And I worked for two weeks through the research, and there were probably 40 research papers, and by then about two and a half thousand Native Americans had been had their mitochondrial DNA tested, so that's their basically their maternal line. And all of their maternal lines bar about a one or, one or two percent were clearly derived from Asia and the other lines looked like they came from Europe and Africa. So um, I, I didn't subscribe to the limited geography. I was, I 
believe the Book of Mormon like most of the church still does, that the, you know, most of the Native Americans and Polynesians are descended from Lehi. And that's what I believed and it, to, to, that just completely shocked me. So, after two weeks, I, um, I, I was just in a terrible state of cognitive dissonance. I had, I believed the science, it was obvious, it was science I was very familiar with. I uh, don't believe any of the apologetic nonsense about me being a plant geneticist and not understanding DNA because it's just rubbish. Um, I understood the science quite clearly, it's very easy, and, but I also knew the Book of Mormon was true. And mine the way I understood the Book of Mormon, because I've read it seven times, I know what the Book of Mormon says, they didn't, they didn't fix, they didn't um, line up. So I, um, after two weeks of grappling with the evidence, um, we just happened one night to be sitting down with our children. We chose, a, we we're going to sing a primary song with our children, and we chose Book of Mormon stories, and it was probably the wrong primary song to sing, uh, because by the end of that song, I was pretty, pretty deeply upset and pretty emotional about the whole thing. And I, I remember thinking at the time, I'm never going to sing that song again with my children because it's wrong. It's just wrong, um, and. So I went to bed just feeling very melancholy. I was upset and I woke up in the morning and I, I finally knew, I knew without a doubt that the, the Book of Mormon wasn't history. It's a, it's a great book filled with scripture and all these stories. It never happened. There was never a migration of Jews to the Americas in 2000 BC or 600 BC. So. And all my research of the last 15 years has convinced me that that conclusion is 100% correct. There's, there's no evidence of any Jewish DNA or Middle, Middle Eastern DNA coming into the Americas. Okay. Pretty, pretty compelling stuff for me. And, and I, you know, I, I'm not, this is my work, that's my research area. I work with DNA and, and I've worked with it for a long time and led research groups that work in population genetics. That's another thing you'll hear from the apologist. Oh, he doesn't know population genetics. It's such a complex science. Um, it is a complex science, but I work in population genetics. I've published in population genetics um, in leading international journals. So it's, uh, and, and, and when you work in the field and you understand the power, you know the full power of the research. It's very compelling when you see that evidence. Mm -hmm. And it's, you, you just can't ignore it. So, so what happened after, from the time you were bishop to, you know, let's go to today, as far as your church? Uh, well, we actually, uh, whilst I knew that the Book of Mormon wasn't history, I hadn't totally concluded. I didn't want to throw the whole baby out with the bathwater, and I uh, was a primary teacher in, um, in a church for a couple of months. Um, I may not have been there every week, because I think I might have had some conferences to go to, but I... And the, the, the I, you know, I, I, I would talk to, you know, the new bishop, or actually there hadn't been a new bishop called, that takes about six weeks. Um, but I was released. Everyone locally that knew me was very polite to me, and because I knew, you know, we'd shaken hands, they knew, they looked me in the eye, they knew that I was a good bloke. Um, but then area leaders um, wrote to me, Vaughan J. Featherston wrote to me, um, and in that letter, it was uh, the whole letter was designed to scare me back into the church. Um, and he hadn't even spoken to my state president. He all he heard was rumours around the grapevine, and this bishop in Brisbane had left the church over DNA. And uh, he wrote me this letter. But you hadn't left the church. You were no, still in the I church. hadn't left the church. I, I mean, it was I. I was aware of the fact that I probably would, um, but I received it when I was still still a primary teacher. I mean, what do you do when you're the bishop and you don't believe the Book of Mormon's true? How can you function as a bishop when you've got the keystone of the Mormon religion? You don't believe it ever happened, and so I was, it wasn't appropriate for me to be the bishop. So I did the right thing, and so anyway, he wrote this uh, three-page letter, and so I I wrote back and I told him off, and I, and I, I didn't rebuke him. I just said. It was inappropriate for him to write to me without 
talking to my state president and finding out really what was going on. So he wrote back a little later and apologised and, and then gave me more warnings about <laughs> how bad life would turn out. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, it's been a tough ride leaving the church and this is what um, you know, many members of the church don't realise that it's a very painful process to leave the church. Um, and so, yeah, we my in fact, during that process, probably five years after we left, I was briefly separated from my wife and then we got back together and, and we're still together and we're very happy. We've been, um, it's just been getting better and better. We just love being outside of the church. We actually don't think about the church a great deal. <laughs> there <laughs> so, I am. <laughs> and here you are hauling me back into this mess. <laughs> Yeah. I hope this isn't too painful. Yeah, so so I, I was excommunicated and it was uh, during that period that I was separated from my wife and the church. Uh, they didn't charge me with apostasy, they charged me with inappropriate relationships with a woman. Um, so this was, all of this went through the press in Australia and you know, my excommunication. I was going to be excommunicated, they didn't need to hold the court. They'd already concluded what they were going to do. They'd already been, already been instructed what to do I'm sure. So, um, and it made the church, church just look terrible, absolutely terrible. It was no doubt the whole excommunication was because I'd written a book. Um, because you talk to any state president or bishop, if somebody's been inactive for seven years, you don't go hauling them in for a church court over some gossip. Because you'd, you'd have your, the state president never get anything done. He'd be hauling church courts every week. So. The whole thing just stank, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what happens when they do terrible things. You um, you look like you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I I I I'm never like you know I'm, I'm a believer. Well, I don't I don't like to hear people leave yeah, either on yeah. their own accord or not on their own yeah. accord. So. Well, th this is the problem when the church deals with people via excommunication, which is so draconian. It is so 15th century. You know, excommunication is just a stupid process. They need to ditch it um, because it just makes the church look bad. It hurts people. Uh, it didn't hurt me. I was fine for, for, to go through the whole process because I knew I was right. And um, yeah, but it, anyway, that that all. Yeah, work. I, I have a friend who's who's Jewish, and so I was talking to him ab about the Jewish religion. And he yeah. told me, you cannot be excommunicated as a Jew. And I was like, really? I, I said, even for murder? He goes, no. Um, yeah. you, God is your judge. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Mm. Um, so, uh, Well, it's, it's, a, it's just an archaic process. Um, you go in there and you're told that six of the brethren are going to be on your side and make sure you're fairly represented and six are going to be making sure the, the church is well represented and whatever. It's just rubbish. All, every, I sat through dozens of these disciplinary councils, even on stake level, because very often there weren't enough high councilmen. I was, always, I was never on a stake calling, I was a bishop or in a bishopric. So I sat through dozens of them. Um, and they're, you know, it's, it's whatever the stake president wants. They just all agree. Hmm. Mm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Simon Southerton. In our next conversation, we'll talk more about DNA testing of potential Lamanites. And the Mayan civilization is where the limited geography and all the BYU scholars have, have focused their attention. 633 Mayans have been DNA tested and 629 have an Asian DNA lineage. Another three have a, an African lineage and then one has a European lineage. There's no Middle Eastern DNA. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you like our page on facebook.com slash gospel tangents. You can subscribe at YouTube at youtube.com slash gospel tangents. We're also on Twitter at gospel tangents, as well as make sure that you subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss any of our episodes. Thanks again for listening. Click here to subscribe here for a transcript, and over here you'll see some more of our videos. Thanks again.